Hey everyone, welcome to Sarah Kuro Interviews. Today I have a perfect stranger online, Frederick James Koch, actor, songwriter, singer. He wrote the tune I'm Running for a movie called Nightwalk in which he co-stars alongside Mickey Rourke. What? <laughs> welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and um, look, I don't know you, and most of the people I interview I know personally and I want to support them, but you stopped me on a train. That's a really weird thing to do these days. So what made you talk to me, man? Um, I don't know. I think the first thing was, like, it, that's, a, that's a really long story for, like, where I'm at right at the moment. But I think, Let's have it. Um, just Melbourne is such, a, such an unusual place because I, 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 I spent most, a lot of my life growing up here. Um, the second part, like I think from my, when I was 20, I, so I, I grew up here and it's always, Melbourne has been a very unfriendly place for me. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know why, I, and then I'm sure everyone's going to be, oh, what? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> this is your story. But, um, but yeah, I, I, it's been a very clicky part for me. I think I could count all my friends probably on one hand very easily. Um, and then I think it's just me coming back during this lockdown phase. Like I came back. I think November of 2019, and um, I don't know. There was something in me that sort of just really just resonated with the place for some reason. It was the, maybe it was just I don't think I've been here in this city as an artist, mm. you know. And it's that kind of has reshaped my energy with the city. Maybe yeah, got it. And I've just sort of. I was kind of just opened up to it. It's it's really it's really quite strange because everything that has come along my way, and it's I'll get into it in a bit, but like everything that's come my way, I've kind of said, yeah, okay, let's do that. Uh, yeah, okay, even this, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you can't say no to me. Um, yeah. So actually, on that train, I got a really great vibe from you. Actually, um, you started talking to me. I think because I had a violin case, but um, at first I'm like, oh, God, who's this person? Do I have to talk to this person? But as soon as I started talking to you, I'm like, oh, wow, what a nice guy. <laughs> and, and, like, Melbourne tends to bring out the worst in people. It's stressful. There's too many people. There's a lot of road rage. And, and yeah. it's just like it can be really closed off. But like you say, if you delve into that sort of slightly underground arty world, then there's so many little secret beautiful bubbles that you oh, can absolutely. that you can find. But first let's talk about your your background. So what interests me more than that you're a musician, sorry, I'm a musician, boring, um, <laughs> is that you're an actor. And I, I want to go right back to um, you studied at NIDA, is that correct? Was that worth it, let's say? <laughs> well, I didn't do the, I didn't do the full-time course there. I want to be straight about that. Like I, I did, I did like a, a plethora of the short, short yep. time, like the short courses they do. Yep. And that was because I was actually at the, at that particular point in time, I was studying at, um, no, I was training and working at um, Department of Defense in Canberra. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was working as a strategic negotiator. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I know. And basically what happened there was um, I had that sort of that dark night of the soul moment where I was sort of, what am I actually contributing? And what, what is it that, what is it that I, that I want to do here? Because there was, I remember explaining the story to somebody and they were sort of like, um, of what I do there. And it, it was sexy, but at the same time, it, like I remember explaining it to somebody and they were like, wow, that's so amazing. And I was like, whoa, wait, I, I really didn't tell you that story properly, I'm sure. How are you? Yeah. Oh, maybe I'm sitting in the wrong seat, mm. you know, and, and, and that, kind of, that kind of got me into this moment where I was like, where, what do I want to do? And, and that whole NIDA thing, that whole, that was a test for me after like weeks and weeks and end of going, what is it that would really sort of, resonate with me and instead of like every person on the planet seems to do which i have done multiple times instead of running away from something mm. um that you're doing how about running towards something that you mm. want and that mm. might shift the way things move and I, I remember just thinking myself thinking to myself you know what i'm gonna do this night of stuff and i'm gonna apply for some i'm gonna apply for some courses um some you know some uh long-term sort of courses like three-year ones and with NIDA and um 
WAPA and uh, what is it, Actors Centre Australia, and mm-hmm. see, see if I get if I get uh, if I get picked, or if at least I get um, offered a spot, then mm-hmm. at least it would probably mean that I have something to offer. Mm. You know, because everybody's always going to be like, oh yeah, I'm 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 great because my mum tells me so. <laughs> <laughs> so so you want to you want to at least have some sort of uh, proper sort of backing with that you know so you can actually decide as to whether that's something that you really want to do or if it's something that um your heart's telling you to do because you know Mm. those aren't always going to collide just because you love it it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be something that's going to be loving you back yeah you get that a lot in my industry actually there's a lot of um students maybe who want to be a violinist and it's Mm -hmm. part of their whole self-worth that they have to be a violinist and maybe some of them really shouldn't be a violinist they should be studying music in a different way or trying to write music or or yeah yeah, they're blinded by their sort of self-image of of the whole thing but so you must have had a few successes to then continue on you you went off to LA did you tell us about that transition go on well that was that transition was that was crazy actually that was I remember that I was writing off the coattails of the first film that I was in that I wasn't allowed to be doing. I did that. In, what? Yeah, I wasn't like during, because I, I, I was offered a position within the Actor Centre Australia. Yeah. And they're very firm about taking roles during the time that you're actually doing it. They feel that it, and it does, it, they feel that it breaks up your, your studying. It dishevels your partners that you're working with, you know, right. that you're probably, you're working with because all of a sudden they're like you know there's oh well this guy's working with this person already oh my god what, what chance do i have and then suddenly their work starts to suffer um right in the room of of uh within the four walls of that of that of that system so mm. you've got to be sort of really sensitive to all of that and um what happened was i remember that was really hard because it was sort of like wow do you take the role that on paper was sort of like, man, this is going to be a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Like, this is, I get to play Jack Bauer basically in a film where the evil guy is Ben, so Ben Kingsley, you know, yeah. taking him around town. Um, or I wait out the last six months oh. of my, of my, of my uh, drama thing that I've done two years, no, two and a half years of now. Yep. Do I fulfill that? Or do I do, oh, my God. And Take the I, opportunity, oh, yeah. That was really tough. And, like, I think every artist has those. those Absolutely. Problems, you know, yeah. like, and after finishing it, after graduating, um, that's when um, I decided it would be best to write off the coattails of that film, whether it was a success or not. At least there was, there was some grounding on, on, um, on my on my CV, so to speak, of yeah. where I could go and where I could be offered. So that was the big proponent for me to go to LA and then make contacts there. And that actually, it's a very slow process. If if, if it's not something that's the hottest thing since sliced bread, um, yeah, if, it's it's always going to be a challenge. And I think like when I did that, it was the right time, but there was also a lot of things involved that needed to, there was a lot of moving parts that were really difficult to sort of maneuver. I think I was studying, and again, at that time, I was studying just after doing that, film i was studying at uh at after um after is at uh, the australian film television and radio school and i was studying directing and writing mm. and um yeah that was so challenging I, every time there was always something that like you know like do you believe in academics more than you believe in yourself yeah. and it was always a challenge and mm. like that la that la journey was fruitful but at the same time like i would probably if anybody's thinking that they've done a small part and they want to go over there, I would definitely recommend saving a lot of money because yeah. everything over there is money. Like there's nothing that you can do that's not like from from rent to to to, to literally rubbing shoulders with your contemporaries that you need to be doing. Um, you cannot go out there without, you know, like everybody knows that you've got to do something yet. You need mm. to, you know, to network. literally be networking. Mm. But to go to these events, it's expensive. Everything is expensive. And they will not, like, no matter how how amazing you are, like, mm. if you can, like, the old saying of can you cry on key, that really doesn't matter to me. Mm. But but if you are so emotionally available or, um, like, ridiculously good with your craft in the sense that you can learn any script and do it straight away, um, it doesn't matter when it comes to America. Like, they're, they, 
we have much more focused, I want to say, schooling here. Mm -hmm. But over there, unless you're doing the drop-in class every week, like it's sort of you're yeah. not not considered somebody that's that's serious about acting, and that's it's ridiculous. But that's the truth. There, like you have to be, you know, um, you know, you have to be doing UCB, or you have to be doing, you know, to, to be doing comedy, or you have to be doing like mm -hmm. they have these idea ideas set out, and that's it. Like you don't, you know, yeah, um, don't fall into them otherwise. So you, you don't to, regret you know, it though, do you? Going there, um. I think I, we were there. For, I, I was there for like a little bit of time. So I think I think the timing I think was was really difficult for me. And I think like you'll hear all these magical stories about people sleeping in their car and like you know having a gym membership to go and you know have a shower and stuff like that, and then magically being discovered by um, <laughs> you know James Cameron or something like that. And and it's you know that I think those stories are really awesome and they're great. If, you know, but at the same time, it's sort of like you know, there's a, there's a lot of time in between, which is really tough unless you have the ability to, um, to look after yourself over there properly. And I felt like I was, I had a savings account and it was going to be, mm, yeah. you know, yeah. and like you can't, even though I had uh, one of the visas that I think was like an O1 visa, an extraordinary talent visa, even if you have that, um, and that was off the backs of like having films to do, like you're still not gonna, you're still not gonna be having enough. Uh, you're not still gonna be making enough money unless you're doing yeah. lots of commercials and a lot of. Yeah, films. Mm. you yeah. don't have regular income at all. There's no, nothing regular about. It. Even if you have your big break in one film, that's no guarantee of another film. Did Did you have an agent or an agency, or do you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Over there at the time, I did. Um, yeah. I think in coming back, I've sort of I've parted ways with that connection because it's mm. just at the moment it's just like. There was so few things coming through. Yeah, it's more money out the door. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. and in all honesty, I, I <laughs> to be hundred percent honest, I think if you if we had this interview six months ago, you would have been I would have been saying yes, I am no longer an actor anymore. And, you know, right, right. It's, yeah, but it's all of this. That's how quickly everything can change. Like it's yeah. film was in the can like about maybe a year ago, a year and a half. Ago. You're talking about Nightwalk? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's just sort of like you don't – sometimes you just don't know what the status of these things are. You do yeah. your job and then you leave and yeah. then all of a sudden all these other things come up. So, yeah. Yeah. Do I regret going to L.A.? No, I don't. Do I regret the, the, the strategy that I took when I went to L.A.? Possibly, yeah. Oh, but you didn't know. You know, you just gave it your best shot and that's, yeah. that's that. Yeah. What about – let's talk about some technical things. Like let's talk about what it was like being on a movie set. Yeah. What, what was it shot on location somewhere? Was it the combination of the um, studio? What what was that? The nitty gritty. We don't know the nitty gritty. We want to understand what it's like being on a movie set. Is it exciting? Is it glamorous? Do you get your own trailer? Is it awful? Is it grueling, hard slog? Is it like tell me, tell me what it's like? It's it's all of those things. It's all of those things. It's like it's um I think I think um it's interesting as an actor you. And I've been on really low budget stuff and I've been on, on really high budget stuff. And the thing is, I think the difference is, is that there's a, there's a healthy respect for the actors in the sense of like, we know that you need to do a job that at the, at, at literally at the click of plastic, you need to be on. there yeah. and doing your thing because yeah. everybody else has been setting up lights, setting up wardrobe, setting up, you know, um, the, you know, set decoration. They've been doing this stuff the yeah. whole day and now yeah. we're ready for you to do your thing, right? Yeah. And the difference between something that's really amazing and something that's really shit is literally the actor. It's literally <laughs> that, that it, it's literally the, 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 the level to which that actor is committed and connected and how much they're conducive to that moment and connection with that other person in front of the camera. That's it. It doesn't... Like you know, if you don't if you don't capture it well, yeah, sure, you probably get a bad take. But as far as I'm concerned, like being able to like from the position of being all of those hats before, like the writer, the director, the set decorator, all of that sort of stuff, it doesn't matter if the actor isn't on. So if you don't give them what they need, then it's just yeah, got it. You, totally you're losing the water. So the difference between all of those different things is that you'll find that there'll be there'll be definitely there'll be sets that like that really respect that. 
And they might hate actors for yeah. being divas, <laughs> divas, but they're yeah. like, you know what? We need you. And yeah. that's what, like, if, if, like, I've been on, I've been on stuff before that I've got like a, a six o'clock call and then we were shooting at like 11 o'clock. Yeah. And the actors that I was working with at that particular point, because I wasn't producing, I was training, I was, I was training them and coaching them because I was just, they weren't really actors. They were just mm. people. And when we trained, their performances were amazing. And I was wow. like, wow, this is, I'm so excited for this, like to be the writer and director and then being in this and not really doing anything except connecting with these guys. They were on. Wow. When they got a six o'clock call yep. that to, to perform at like when we started rolling 11 o'clock, mm. they were useless. Fried, it was, yeah. It was terrible. And I was just like, man, yeah. why did you do that? Yep. You did not need to do that. Like I know the producers need to shove their weight around and they need mm. to feel like they're important. Um, especially with directors as well, they feel like they had this huge ego thing. Mm. But you've just destroyed that mm. creative big work mm. because of your because of your need to push your weight around. Yeah. You know, it's, and and I know that there's this there's definitely this level of like, oh, actors are such divas, but it's not that. It's sort of like if you need to be going through like if you need to be traversing emotional areas that you're not used to, if you're in front of the camera where you're not used to in front of the camera, if you're if you're engaging on a level that needs you like hundred percent of your energy mm. while those cameras are on, then like what do you expect but that? You know what I mean? Like yeah, treat totally. You with respect. Yeah, there's there is unfortunately a really unhealthy respect for actors when it comes to comes to that sort of stuff, and I think it's. You know, that, that's, it's literally for producers out there that might be listening to this. It's yeah. literally it's between, between <laughs> whether you are going to get yourself a good performance yep. or a bad performance. And that and that has an overlaying, you know, arch of do you want a good product or not? Look, this reminds me so much of, of sometimes in artistic organisations, the administration mm-hmm. put themselves above their creative uh, personnel. Yep. In their own minds, so so they start treating the actors, sorry, the actors, the musicians, um, as if they're, you know, they've got to come in through the service entrance, and they, yeah, um, yeah. you know, that it's 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 really difficult situation because we do whinge, we do mm. have special needs, and yep. to put out what we need to put out. It's yeah. exactly the same. Rachmaninoff Symphony. That's what we're doing this week. The conductor does not let up. We love him. But the energy you need, like you say, the energy is everything. And, yeah, those around you really do have to respect that. Um, Yeah, so let's talk about – oh, look, you said something before. It's all the energy of the actor, right? But I've noticed a few shows that I've watched where I've really appreciated the acting but I have not appreciated the script. So how do you deal with a lame script? Even though, even if the storyline is good, there's something about script writing. Mm. And I don't know if you've had any experience with actual script writing. There's something really unbelievable about some, the way some people write scripts. For example, from my point of view, I often don't like the way the female lead is is portrayed. There's usually a bit too much victim-y sort of pathetic, oh, I need a man to help me kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's obviously the female lead has been um, written by uh, a man who is, doesn't hate women at all but just doesn't have quite the same sense yeah. of what it is to be a strong lead female. So mm-hmm. have you come across like uh, do you think about that? I know you're a, you're a guy but you you might not have to think about it but have you come across any sort of changes in the last 10 years according to female leads? Because I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, female directors, female producers now and all that's being born now in Hollywood. Yeah, well, what yeah, do you yeah. make of all of that? It's fine if you don't think about it, you don't care about it. But Oh, I absolutely do think about it. I think, like, literally the – I'm still having, like, with a, with a particular uh, a film that I'm writing right now that's that's um, that was supposed to be – be filming like last year that I was that I was already we already signed off and it was fine I'm still going back for rewrites and changing the female in it because of that um I find it so important to sort of like even though they might be supporting a protagonist Mm. there's an element of like well everybody is really their own protagonist in the story right Mm. so what would be a very like what would be a grounding like 
tangent for this character because they're not always going to be just conducive to whatever the, the protagonist is doing. So what is their real... And I think that it, it is interesting exactly what you say when it comes to... When it comes to these these female roles that are being written today mm. sometimes it can be really really just tiring to see them that there's just always needing the man like the damsel in distress is just they're just not believable them. roles that's what my point they're not they're not believable because yeah. because yeah. there are different ways that women are allowed to be now mm. which has created mm. this whole new world of yeah. what it means to be a female in a world um, that yeah. that lets that's, us you know absolutely and that's what what's really what I always try to, to breathe in with that is that the story arc for the character is the most important thing when it comes to telling stories. And I think that stuff, that component of thing, that way of storytelling can be used in a really, really effective way if that's for that character towards the beginning of the story and then it sort of takes a turn. If that character is that, that way all the way through the film, like I was just thinking of like, the only thing that comes to my mind right now and is, I think it was San Andreas, how like the family needed to be, you know, saved by the father and he had to come and save everybody. They were in like LA and everything was going to fall to pieces unless he came to save them. And I just think, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, I get that. That makes, mm. you know, like he's the, you know, special forces dude or the savior or whatever. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, it's so important to have like that, if that is what we see women, then like, especially when it's in the media, then what, what effect is that having to men in, in real life? Yeah, like, absolutely. That's, that's sort of what I mean. If, if men are constantly presented with this weak victim um, female yeah, on TV, but then in their real life, the girl is standing up to them and saying, I'm yeah. not going to put up with that anymore and I'm going to leave you. And, and it's really a, a conflict. It is. It's a huge conflict. And I think mm. it's as, as, as women take more of a role in their own sort of um, way that they want to be written, it's really, really important that they not only have say, but they, on, they also have an engagement with men to, to rewrite that. Absolutely. It's, yes. It's, it's, it's what I've seen is, is it can be very counterproductive just for women to have the reins only. In oh, absolutely, of, absolutely. It sounds, it sounds weird maybe to say that, but I feel like that's when you get these ridiculous, like it's just basically sex change. Yeah, absolutely. It's just polarisation as well. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. You've just got, yeah. you get this basically really strong, hard anti-hero female that yeah, um, yeah. wants to make friends but will look after this poor, you know, like the, like the what is it? Um, what was that Angelina and Jolie film that just came out just recently? Um Oh, <clears throat> yeah, what's it called? I don't know. I can't remember. I, yeah. And the first thing I thought was, wow, okay, so this was written for a man. They just changed the woman out. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly right. Yeah, so we've like got that. to make a new story, as you say. Exactly. Well, that can be your next uh, your next little project. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I love I love <laughs> that idea and I, I feel like I am, it's going to sound weird, I, I feel like I am, especially in the last maybe year or two, very, very connected with the, with that feminine energy of, of mm. um, and being explorative on that side of things as far as like trying to understand more about the inside of things that most people would be very sort of um, apprehensive about exploring. Mm. And I think it's it's so important as an artist to understand those components to it, you know, like and especially as somebody that was always very, very much centered in the middle um, and maybe traversed a little bit too much to the to the yang for a little while. Yeah. Um, in search of that too, right? Like is that's that's part of the the the, the masculine that, that you know that we all have that yep. uh, it's men that we all have to sort of to understand us and to be to grow into who we need to be sometimes we really do need to explore that and i think that's it's vice versa with women as well they do yep. need to understand that that masculine strength absolutely you know us, right so yeah yep. it's 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 it is literally the, the two parts of the whole of who make who make yeah this world. And we, as we talked on the train, I feel like that culturally as well. I feel like that as long as Australians really don't have a culture or do, like I'm talking about Western Australians, if they don't have their own, they've lost their own culture, so they mm -hmm. can't respect other cultures properly. But if, if we enjoyed and appreciated our own history in, in a more positive yeah. sense rather than just, oh, we're all just colonists and we're, we're destroying mm -hmm. everything, if we try and find the 
the, the amazing parts about our own culture, then we mm. can look at other cultures and, and really appreciate the, the things that those other cultures can bring to the world. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's why I get on with you and the train because you are, you, you've got a wider sort of perspective and you're kind of exploring and, and you know that your life isn't um, just this one little box of a oh, thing. absolutely. And it's like the, the thing is, is that I think I, I honestly believe that if I was to meet me two years mm. down the track or two years behind the track, I would actually still be able to converse really take grubby for a second here, like converse in the sense that I would be almost a completely different person. Right. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You know, that that person at that time is a different person in the sense that they will have a lot of familiar things that, that and that's kind of almost like if you, if you look at it in that Facebook echo chamber. Thing, yeah. <laughs> that have our own, we love to hear what, what uh, what our friends are thinking, but at the same time, as soon as it's alien enough, we just go, "Oh, you're you're ridiculously left or yeah. ridiculously oh, right." It's, we're all it's we're irritating. all we're not we're not islands, but we're we're boats in the ocean, right? We're, we're our, our, our thoughts and our perspectives on things change with mm. every experience. That we Hopefully, have. yeah. And it's if if we don't, well, then what what's the point? What's mm. the point? This, of us being here because the, for me the idea of the human condition the human experience is to to learn and to to uh to experience that emotional mm. connectivity that we have with with everyone and it's sort of like you can learn from everything yeah, absolutely you know I mean? like you really can and like just by what you were saying before i had just this idea of like you know when you're saying about the you know our history of colonists and that's i think there's a there's definitely that for a lot of us especially artists we, we feel that colonist component is like it's it's almost an ugly component. It's the it's the masculine take taken to the to the nth Extreme, degree, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas like these guys, they, these guys went forth and wanted to explore and discover mm, and destroy yeah. and burn and hack and yeah. you know and um and then take over. And then mm. the feminine is what we're feeling right now, which is the the, the sort of the how do we how do we how do we heal those, mm. those burns? How do we can collectively connect with the indigenous people mm. of this beautiful land and somehow soothe those wounds? They'll mm. never be completely healed, but how mm. do we do that? That's that's really, really difficult. It's not yeah. it's, I think it's it's not something that is in the masculine vernacular. Mm. You know, it's not. And it's and it's but it still is within every male type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's within our power to do that. And you can flip the masculine extremes to how they're positive too, protection of the tribe, Absolutely. the hunting, the gather, like the hunting of the food for the tribe. I mean, the, the masculine isn't necessarily negative. It's just Absolutely. like you say, when it's when the background of it is, say, maybe greed or fear or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But so mm -hmm. let's talk about um, how music has changed you. So you feel like you just released this song recently, right, last month, um, I'm Running, yeah. and... What was that? I mean, you, you've obviously written music before, but was this song particularly special? Um, it was actually. I think. I think the I've I've written I've written other music before. Sorry, I'm just moving this because the light keeps on, keeps on going crazy. <laughs> it's a bit early um, for you, is it, Freddie? It's too early. For you. <laughs> I'm getting used to this rock star life. The actor life was okay. I could I could manage that, but the rock star life is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I I. Uh, this film, this this film was was pretty magic, and and I think with the music stuff, um, it's been a very very long and arduous sort of journey for me. In that, like when I was a kid, like uh, I'm not sure if I've discussed this one before, but I, I I growing up in a family of musicians, my dad is a musician, a very successful one in Sri Lanka, um, and a lot of Asia as well, um, and w I've always. With, when it came to music, I've always been in the shadows for that. And I've, I think just my dad is like, he's an amazing musician. But when it comes to, um, when it comes to his way of the way that he sees music and mine and what it does and what it can do, it's, they're different elements. Like I've, I've been the observer for so long. I've always had this, this sort of, uh, way of looking at things that I, I don't think I was, I felt like I was ever, ever worthy of, of singing in front of people. And that mm. might sound to some musicians, it might sound like very familiar. And for some people, it might 
feel like it's like what the hell is he talking about? It's ridiculous, yeah. <laughs> um, especially especially from an active point of view. And now, as an actor, if you give me a microphone and you put me on stage, I can perform probably to pitch anything that you want me to, and I'll give a show that would be not only memorable, but people will be like, well, "Holy crap, that's wow, that's you can do that." Mm. But there's something about sitting there with a guitar or whatever it is and then allowing, instead of performing, allowing the audience in. Oh, lovely. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and that's not something that's a common sort of trait with mm. all, all musicians, I think. Yeah. Like there, there is, it is there, definitely, but it seems to be either one or the other. Mm. And I think what I've, what I've sort of gained from this particular project is that sort of insight to that the acting capacity and the, and the, um, which is the performing out and then the, the sort of the drawing in as well. Yeah, um, beautiful. Yeah, that's, it's really like, it is, it has been a really, really amazing exploration into that. And that's, there's something that's just so, lack of a better word, so tasty. Mm-hmm. When you see, uh, when you see somebody that's going through something and you're just like you're taken on a journey but you're pulled towards it Mm. it's such a beautiful energy and i think i think what this project allowed me to do was to understand and understand the story the narrative internally and then when writing this song with with my um with my writing partner um, az sheriff over in sri lanka um I was going through a lot of, at that time, I was going through a lot of tumultuous stuff and a lot of the stuff that was written was literally what was going into that story. Like, you know, um, to find my love, to find my way, I've got to push through all this dark uncertainty because that's what it's about, right? Like that's, and to be able to, to be able to find that, you don't know if it's there. Like acting, all of this stuff, all of life, what is it? But the journey that we're on, you've got to go through it to find this stuff and to, and to actually express that through song, like there is both those elements of like performing it and allowing people to come in because that darkness, that, 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 that sort of not knowing where you're going, that's a really, really scary thing to know as a human being, right? But to express that, how do you do that? You know, so um, this project, basically when we were in there, when we were in, uh, in Morocco, we were shooting on location in Morocco to go back to what you were asking about mm-hmm. Beautiful, amazing stuff of the set, which I didn't really quite explore accurately for you. Um, we were shooting on set on in nightclubs, in um, in the desert, in like in jails, in the desert, in, like just amazing places, terrifying places. Um, and then in LA, we were shooting like you know just in, on set, and just no no hassles. But with this, while we were actually on set in a jail, I believe where there was rumored to be ghosts and all that sort of nasty stuff, which um, it was, I felt very true. Um, my dad had was, he, they came over for a while to, to, uh, to explore the whole Moroccan um, journey as well. And, and while they were there, um, he became very good friends with the director. And he was like, he kind of pitched to them. Oh, I said, so what's the theme song? Today? I'd love to hear the song. Do you have it? Like, and he's like, Oh, we, we haven't we haven't really thought about uh, uh, a theme song yet, uh, but uh, yeah, we I should probably do that. And that's like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I might be able to do something for you. And then, like at the end of the day, after that set, he was like, "Oh, um, but there's a we are, uh, um, so uh, how was the day? How was the day filming?" I went, "Oh, it was really arduous, really, but I loved every moment of it." And he's like, oh, "Anyway, you've got something to do in the night. You've got to write a song." <laughs> I was like, well, what? <laughs> what are you doing? And that wasn't my first. That wasn't my first project where I've written a song before. There's quite a few that I've written, but this one being so connected to the script, it was it was quite easy for me to jump in there um, emotionally. But um, the story behind that was when he was still he was still intending to sing the song. That was still going to be Dad's song that I wrote. Oh. Um, and then when I went into the studio and wrote it with Az. Uh, what happened was um, I was so nervous because those emotions that were in that song were so close to home um, that I just I just couldn't stop effing singing that song oh, wow. all night. And I probably got about maybe two, three hours sleep. And when I got to the studio, um, 
he wanted me to, because my voice is very similar to my dad's, there's a very similar tone to it. Um, he wanted me to do a vocal a vocal track so dad could understand the highs, the lows, the, the melody of the song. And I remember just going, okay, I've, I've, I've got to try and do this in the way that dad, like dad's older, so there's definitely notes that he won't be able to go to. And it's, you know, there's definitely areas that he's comfortable in, there's definitely areas and i was seeing it and i was just um as i was doing it there was probably challenging parts that i went through anyway but i was so nervous that my voice went to a sort of a different tonality which almost is now more present in my in my vocalization and i'm singing now a lot more and when that came out when that vocal track came out for dad he listened to it and was like whoa <gasps> you know i i think this it. song this <sighs> is your song like you can't like you know and there was a real sort of a moment there of like you could i could almost feel him like in the same in the same moment i could see him feeling that that the song was a hit song mm. and at the same time he could also sort of go no but this belongs to you this oh is- and passing on the baton yeah. to you or something like that yeah, how it profound <gasps> it was it was it was really cool and i i remember um showing it to maybe two or three people in the family and then hearing it and knowing the background that I have. Like I, I literally would not sing in front of people. I would I would be so terrified to do so that I would – I used to I, – I might get emotional when I say this, mm. but I used to uh, – I used to close my door and I would put a radio in front of the door facing out and then I would get my guitar and I would get into the closet <laughs> – and I would play because I was so terrified of people uh, of people giving me criticism, mm. and I couldn't I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't, I couldn't. But it wasn't an ego thing. I don't get that from you. I don't think you would have been angry that people were telling you what to do or anything. It was more no, an insecurity no. or something. It was so. an insecurity. It was a deep, and that's still there. That's still there. It's a deep, deep insecurity of like of not being worthy of of people listening. You know, um, and does that also come from your dad? Was there any relationship with your dad that maybe yeah. you couldn't live up to his expectations? Oh, or absolutely, something like that? absolutely. I think that was definitely the case. Like, I think, I think um, the way that the way that you know, and, you, and as a child, and even as an adult, you're 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 privy to to those things that people won't see when it comes to. I mean, just going out to dinner, you would see people coming up and just be going, oh. Uh, Mr. Cock, oh, it's, I'm so happy to meet. And like the, well, yeah, the the weight that those performances have had on some people's experiences of life, and how it might have changed their moment, or how they've connected mm. with the song. To witness that in a in a very sort of just a very, um, in a way that it the song isn't even in the air, but it is. You know what I mean? Like no one's hearing a note. But then having somebody go up to them, and you know, like it's it is the same thing today when you have people coming up and doing you know selfies with a with an actor or with a with a musician or something like that. But to to see that profound effect that that's had on other people, yeah, and then like seeing that and then going, wow, how could I ever reach that level of stuff? Mm. And to connect back to that story that I was telling you about, like hearing the song for the first time and, and letting family members see that. I remember my one of my cousins hearing it. And, she just posted on Facebook today and I, I really got emotional when she said it. But um, she was saying about, like, I was literally watching her and her goose, she just started getting goosebumps. Oh. Like, oh, my God. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And I was just like, that's the feeling that I had when I heard the song for the first time. And I was just thinking, wow, this is, this is profound. Like, to actually be able to, to get out what I wanted that was just in my gut mm. and to allow that to be shared was mm. such a, a beautiful thing that I think I think every actor and every every other really oh really you cool. no it's beautiful yeah. love it but um yeah but um I think every actor and every and every musician longs to have those moments you know like where you just sort of like oh yeah. that's that's not I wasn't aiming for that outcome with people. That's maybe per- perhaps in some sort of, you know, uh, periphery. That's what I might have been aiming for. But really, that piece of work is what I was aiming for. You know, and it's very rare that you get to achieve that. And with that song, that's what that, that's given me. Like whether it's a hit or not, and it feels like, honestly, this it, it sounds stupid, but as an, as the, the the 
the environment that we live in, we're literally looking at, you know, the hits and the amount of numbers that people get. Mm. And that's very much how I was feeling yesterday. And it was almost making me depressed because I could feel like, oh, no, it was going like this and now it's going like Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the ego and, though. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's really the ego. And yeah. like, but every time I go back to the song and I go back to that, like the instrument that is me that's 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 performing that song, like I was – it just, it, it really just it gives my heart such a soaring feeling. I'm just like, wow. And it's that a connection, is. a connection you have with your deepest self and then you're connecting with others through that that work exactly. of art. I think it's just incredible. Yeah, there's no way to hide with, with, with projects like that. There's mm. like, it's just, you know, there's, and that's probably part of it too, right? Like that's why it hurts so much when, when, that criticism comes in without being constructive. Mm. You know, it, that's why because you've you've literally gone here. I am naked. Yeah, very vulnerable. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Well, you don't need to vulnerable. care about you don't need to care about what other people think because you know you're a movie star. You are now a songwriter. You you're fine. You live in a beautiful place, oh, and yeah. uh, you that's, don't need anyone's approval. You know, you've done it. Is, yeah, no, this is very true. But also, I've I've kind of learned over this, and this has been something that I've, I've I've been wanting to talk about as well, like on my own sort of. Um, or in a Facebook Live or whatever I'm doing, but that those two, those two, those sort of two levels of how you approach things as an artist, as a human being, right? Where you can be very stoic and go, "This is what you should do. This is what needs to happen. Shut this down," and you're almost like compressing the emotion, so it, you're not connecting. You're yeah. just doing what you need to do to succeed, just like yeah. a soldier, right? Yeah. And then there's that other element where you get up on stage and you're like, "Shit, shit, shit! Oh my yeah. god, there's people there." And the reason why your body is reacting to that is because it matters. Yeah, yeah. Your body's right. going. You want to do well. You yeah. want to do well, and you want to make these people feel great, and you want to feel great. And this is what you love to do. And yeah. that's that side of it. And the two absolutely conflicting components, right? Yeah. yeah. Like this yeah. will get you through. This yeah. will save you. But if you do this, mm. and you at the complete behest of this, and completely ignore it, then why are you doing it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, people are very conflicted and very confused about what they should and shouldn't be doing in life. It's it's hard yeah. because we're we're told all this stuff too. We're we're told all these lies by the media, basically. It's really hard to find ourselves and find connection with people. So, look, you've basically done it. I, I I've I've so enjoyed talking to you. I I can't believe you spoke to me on that train. It was just. It was fate. I, I, I really look forward to all the things you do in your future and I hope maybe one day we can do some kind of show together. I mean, Let's do something, I man. would love, yeah. love, yeah. love that. And, and yeah. you know. Um, we can even do it like right now with the, with the uh, environment that we're uh, up against at the moment. We could even do like a, a secret secret performance somewhere with masks on. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. Be- <laughs> Although we don't have to wear masks inside today. Did you hear the right, news? Right, right. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's a, yeah. really good actually. Wow, okay, cool. Yeah. So, look, everyone out there, I really want you to look this guy up, um, Frederick James Koch, K-O-C-H. Um, I'll have some websites up and some stuff that you can read about. Um Don't forget to head over to my YouTube channel, which is Sarah Kuro, simple as that and a like, subscribe, share, blah, 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 all the things that the young people say. And, um, Freddie, I've just absolutely loved having you on the show. I, I just I, I want to talk to you more. We'll, we'll do a part two, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. I'd love yeah, it. wonderful. All right, thank you so much, Freddie. <laughs> Lovely so to meet you. Me. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm really, really happy that I, uh, that I opened my mouth up on the, uh, on the train and, and decided the masks weren't really uh, – going to stop us from communicating. That's right. It was divine providence. All right. (laughs) Thanks a lot, Freddie. Take care, man. Please.